Hey everyone, you're here with Mark Bowell at PerfectGardens.com. So we got a great question from Ray Ortiz. He wants to use Drops of Balance to recharge his seedlings before they sprout, or probably at this point, after they've sprouted. And he's wondering what the pH is and the parts per million of Drops of Balance should be. So let's go ahead and get into this. Let's read the next question. For some reason, I've been getting plant dampening off, so I use this peroxide on his cocoa. Okay, so first off, let's just talk about Drops of Balance, then we'll get over to the dampening off. First, what makes Drops of Balance different than other nutrients is or trace minerals? Really, the big difference is 99% of all the stuff that is in fertilizers bottles that you'll buy at a hydro store or Home Depot is water soluble salts and when you go out in nature there are minerals out there but those are come from rocks they don't come from salts salts are man-made chemicals man wanted them needed them to be water soluble and so they put them in a form of salts so that the salts would become water soluble because obviously a salt is water soluble. Well, the way Drops of Balance works, or what Drops of Balance is, Drops of Balance is black mica. It's a rock that was actually dissolved in sulfuric acid. And so because you take a rock and you dissolve it in sulfuric acid, and because sulfuric acid is water soluble, it makes the rock now water soluble versus how fertilizer companies do it they'll take phosphoric acid and they will use a weaker acid with the salts that they're combining together to make their product and they will make a water soluble salt fertilizer so to answer your question real quickly drops of balance the parts per million drops of balance when you add it in at a ratio of one ml per gallon will barely increase your parts per million. So that's not something you have to worry about. The th major concern you have to worry about is actually setting your pH of your water prior to adding in drops of balance. The reason why is because anything above, really a, above 7.5, and you really want to keep it under 7, but anything above 7.5 goes into an alkaline. And because what makes drops of balance work is the sulfuric acid, and that is below 7. And so when you have an alkaline environment, it makes the sulfuric acid inert or neutral. So you remove the power of drops of balance, and uh, you just have an alkaline environment with water-soluble minerals suspended, really, really suspended in the alkaline environment. So I would highly recommend that you reduce your pH under 7 and try to always keep it above 5.8 because anything below 5.8, it, it begins to take minerals out of the availability chart, really. I'll make sure you guys understand that a little bit more. 5.8 to roughly 7.3 is that kind of like that ideal range for most minerals to be available for your plants. This is a big deal to understand, especially when you're using synthetic fertilizers in any level and you're growing. The reason why is because those salts that they're using in the fertilizer bottles, when they get out of that range, they will begin to combine back together. Or they'll fall out of solution and your salts are really no longer water soluble and they won't benefit you and your plants. An additional thing to remember is that when you're growing with synthetic fertilizer and you're not growing with microbiology, everything is reliant on you so if you allow your water to be out of that ph range and your salts begin to fall out of solution well that's a hundred percent on you that's all your fault you have no one else to back you up and to help fix really your soil environment when you're growing with microbiology and you're not so fixated on fixing your ph all the time your microbiology will keep changing the pH in your soil dependent upon the CO2 that is released from your roots and the oxygen that is absorbed back into the soil. So when your roots release the CO2 or take up oxygen, it is changing the pH of your rhizosphere. 
And believe it or not, it's not changing the pH of the rhizosphere like this crazy amount. I mean, literally, it's just changing the pH of the rhizosphere within a centimeter of the roots uh, that where they're expanding. So it's not like the whole environment. It's just that's how powerful and sensitive these plants are. And when I kind of came to the realization of how subtle the plants change their pH between the day and the night, uh, dependent upon the release of CO2 or the absorption of oxygen in the roots and how that actually controlled. It was a factor on helping the unlocking of certain minerals for your fungi to go and retrieve them. It made me be a little bit more considerate around the changing of your pH around your grow environment quickly. So what I mean by that is, let's say your soil pH environment is... 6.7 and it's sweet but then your water let's say for some reason your tap water is coming out super high alkaline or extremely acidic well and i'm not sure why i'm just giving this crazy example but let's say you ph your water down to 5.8 well when you feed your plants that nutrients you're now changing the ph of the rhizosphere and when you're adding in synthetic fertilizer or maybe you're making something a little bit too concentrated, it slightly hurts the microbiology. So now instead of you having millions of fungi and billions of bacteria to help you out, now it's solely reliant on you. And if your pH begins to get off a little bit, well, then you begin to have nutrient lockout. And before you know it, other issues begin to arise throughout your grow and you never really see the full potential of the plants because the plant is dealing with a problem on a day in and day out basis that you're really not seeing or noticing because you're doing your part right you're watering your ph you're watering and you're doing everything necessary to keep those plants alive but you're not taking into consideration these drastic changes by using synthetic fertilizer and i'm not saying you're doing that I'm just saying that these are considerations and thought processes I've went through over the last 10 years to adjust my growing program. I have a lot of growers that use synthetic fertilizer. They're incredibly great at what they do and their yields. I mean, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are just superior. Although when you consider the amount of time they dedicate to their plants to get that return, and the amount of time I put into my plants every year to get my return. And then when we compare our terpene counts and terpene profiles, I either get really close to them or I beat them. Normally I have a larger terpene profile than they do. They might beat me on yield because they're using excess stuff and a whole bunch of hormones and other stuff. And it's really interesting too. Those growers that are growing synthetic, they actually don't smoke either. So they don't even try their own end product. Yeah, it looks great. It has a really great yield. When you do side-by-side -side comparisons, it looks the same. But then when you smoke it, that's when you know, wow, you know, this one really hurts my throat. And, and it kind of dries out my throat because I'm smoking salts that are still in my plants, even if they do the greatest flesh in the world. Versus the other one, you could just drag on the joint and the only reason why it will hurt your throat is because you have pulled too much heat into your throat while you're pulling on the joint and you shouldn't even be doing that anyways because you're going to just create a run on the joint and mess it up for everyone else anyways i'm probably ranting a little bit too much at this point next thing is the dampening off so sometimes you're just going to have bad genetics and if you are getting seeds that are dampening off quickly i would recommend using some microbiology some of the minerals to start your seeds off it, but if they're still dampening off then you just have a bad batch of seeds and whoever you're getting your seeds from i would recommend to go and not get it from them go get it from someone else maybe start off with clones at least you have a few good plants and then still plant a couple seeds but as you're working through the seed process and figuring that whole thing out from male to female dampening off and finding the good genetics you want at least you're going to have some of your medicine that's going to be reliable and you're going to still enjoy the growing process versus being annoyed that you're running into some issues. Okay, so Coco, if you are running into issues like this with dampening off, take your seed back to soil. Just take it back to soil, get a healthy plant, then from that get 
your clones and then from your clones take them into Coco. At least you know at that point you have a strong genetics and if your clones are dampening off after you take them from your mother and put them into your Coco, then I would say that whoever you're getting your Coco from, you're getting bad Coco. So it just helps you kind of figure out where your actual problem is coming from and where is the disease originating. Ray, I don't have every single answer. I hope some of these things generated some thoughts for you so that you can apply them in your grow and get a little closer to your expectations at the end of this year. Thank you so much and have a great grow, brother.